Hi Tri-State, welcome to Facebook Live Thursday. I almost said Friday because I'm so used to that. Um, as you guys are getting on today, I'm going to make a couple announcements that I just wanted to make sure everyone was aware of. Um, so the first thing is Sirius XM should be active for those of you who sent in your radio IDs. Um, if you have not done that, please make sure you send your radio ID to uh, Teresa.Porter at RoadmasterGroup.com or to michael.fisk at roadmastergroup.com. So Michael or Teresa is somebody that you need to email your radio ID to for um, SiriusXM. Then the other announcement that I have is we want to congratulate Clyde Nelson. He's a driver for our drum division at Co. Um, he's been awarded um, a Highway Angel Award with the TCA. So it's a very big deal. He gets his award today or have a little ceremony and take some pictures and stuff. So if you know Clyde or if you see Clyde around, make sure you tell him congratulations. Um, today we have Johnny Lester with us with the safety department, and he's going to give us a really awesome presentation. That's really important, so make sure you're ready to listen. And I'm going to flip it on over to him. Okay, you're good. Again, welcome to Facebook Live. As Raleigh said, my name is Donnie Lester. I'm the Vice President of Safety for Tri-State Motor Transit. So today we're going to talk about CSA. I know you're probably getting tired of hearing about CSA, but it's very, very important to us to maintain a good CSA score in each one of the basics. So kind of a little bit of background about CSA. Actually, this is not a new program. The Federal Motor Carriers started working on this program in 2007 and they actually rolled it out in 2010 and they called it CSA 2010. Well, then they revamped the program several times and whenever it first came out it was a Comprehensive Safety Analysis 2010. So after they reworked the program several times they just uh, called it CSA. As you can see up here on the screen, CSA means Compliance, Safety and Accountability. So just a little bit of, of quick background on the CSA program. So what is CSA and how does it affect me? Okay, Rod. So as far as the, the priority, it's how it works is our company safety data appears online in the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Measurement System, in other words, the SMS system. And the Federal Motor Care Safety Administration updates this SMS once a month with data from roadside inspections uh, to include driver and vehicle violations, crash reports for the last two years, and also investigation results. The uh, safety measurement system considers the number of safety violations and inspections, also the severity of the safety violations or crashes, and when the safety violations occurred with recent events weighing more heavily the number of trucks slash buses that carry operates and the number of vehicle miles traveled, plus acute critical violations found during the investigation. Okay. <clears throat> so the Federal Motor Care Safety Administration has organized this SMS data into seven behavioral analysis and safety improvement categories and they're called basics. So there's seven basics that we're dealing with and I'm going to go through those seven basics and what I would do is uh, on each basic I will tell you what it encompasses and then I'll show you what Tri-State uh, is having the, the, the most problems with in each basic. Okay. So the first one is unsafe driving. With unsafe driving that basically encompasses your movie violations, your speeding, your reckless driving, improper lane change, inattention, and no seat belts. <clears throat> so what I've listed here are some of the top violations that we're seeing here at Tri-State. And if you notice, the very first one is speeding, six to 10 miles per hour over the posted speed limit. <clears throat> the federal motor carriers also put a, a, a weighted value on each one of these violations. And like this one shows four right here. So you think, okay, that's four CSA points. Not really, because they also have a time average that they use. If you get it, as soon as you get it, the first six months, it carries that value of three, so it would be four times three. So now you got 12 CSA points. If they put you out of service, you go, they add two to the violation severity weight, and then it's four plus two, which is six, now three, now you got 18 uh, CSA points 
scored against you as the driver and against the company as well. So after six months, the three value drops to a two for the carrier. And then after a year, the two drops to a one. And then after 24 months, these drop off of the carrier. However, with a driver, the CSA scores stay on your profile for 36 months or three years. So our next one is Ferry Go Bike Traffic Control Device, mostly scales. Uh, scales be open and we don't see the sign quick enough, so we bypass the scales or possibly get the green light when we should have actually stopped because we had hazmat on. We're in one of the states that requires us to stop. So that carries a, a weighted average of five. So five times three is 15 CSA points. The next one is state law or ordinance regulations. In other words, we're on a city street where it's got a weight limit sign and we're over that uh, gross amount. So again, that was only one, thank goodness. Uh, the next one, speeding 15 or more miles per hour over the posted speed limit, that's a 10. That's a big one. That's uh, 10 points, and so it's times three. That'd be 30 CSA points against the carrier, 30 CSA points against the driver. And then we go down to the next one, speeding 11, 14 miles per hour over. That's a seven. Failure to use seat belts while operating a commercial motor vehicle, that's a seven as well. So again, when you first get that ticket, it's a seven times three which is 21 CSA points, and then speeding in a, in a, a work zone or construction zone. That carries a, a 10, so, and then also using a handheld mobile telephone while operating a commercial motor vehicle. That's a 10, and I will tell you, we've had that happen one time in the last 24 months, so it's not a big hitter for us. Uh, everybody does a good job about d doing the hands-free or the Bluetooth, whatever, so anyway, uh, and a lot of these are just the one or twoers, you know, so, uh, it's some of them are not that critical but if you get it right in here and that's the important ones for us okay okay crash indicator this is basically just the history I did not list anything uh, on the crash indicator they do have it whenever you look in the SMS basics uh, there's crashes listed but it's it's not for public it's not public information so I didn't list anything because I don't know who I was watching the Facebook Live, you know, and some of this stuff is, is uh, something may be in litigation, I don't want to ex expose that. So anyway, uh, but that's the crash indicator. That's how they, they, they do not look at uh, preventability. Basically, they look at all crashes and they list all crashes. So that's what counts against you is basically all your crashes. Okay. Hours of service. Okay. Our service, and you're probably going to wonder how some of these violations come about with us running electronic logs. I wonder the same thing sometimes. So we're looking at the hour service. In other words, it's pretty simple, non-compliance with the hour service regulation. You know, the duty status, the 11, 14, 70 hour rule. So we're looking at this one, false reported driver's record duty status. That carries a weight of seven. It's also an out of service violation. So it'd be seven plus two. So, and then times three, so you got 27. CSA scores or CSA points and I'll give you an example of, of what happened uh, yesterday. So the DOT officer pulls the driver into the scales to do an inspection and the driver's on the drive line, shows him driving so he, he gets out of his truck and the officer looks at everything and then he looks at his hour of service Well, it still shows the driver as driving and the officer says how come you're not on line four on duty? You know that's maybe a little nitpicky but uh, anyway that's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about false report driver's record duty status. Or you may be driving on your partner's hours of service. You forget to switch it over. So anyway, uh, be mindful of that. Uh, driver's record duty status not current. That carries a score of five. General form and manner, one. Here's the big one. It's, I know it's just got a one severity weight on it. And also the onboard recording device has got a one severity weight. But those are ones that keep adding up. And the one right here where supply a blank driver's record due status, in other words, you're supposed to carry seven day grid with you whenever you're running electronic loads, just in case the system goes down, and it will sometimes, then you're supposed to have a seven day grid where you can do your uh, hours of service manually. So we give everybody a, a full logbook, so you should have the seven days. And then the next one is onboard recording device information not available. 
we give that to you in a laminate sheet. We also put it in the driver's manual and we put it in the permit book. So there's three different places where you can get this information. So whenever we switch over to ELDs, this is very important. Your AOBRD information is going to be voided. It will not be valid anymore. So whenever we switch over to ELDs, and if you've already switched over to ELDs, then make sure you get new instructions. And, uh, and Lee is really good about laminating the new instructions, getting them sent out to everybody. Okay. Um, before we move forward, we do have a question real quick. Um, how do the drivers find out which states they're obligated to go to the way station when hauling hazmat, even after getting a green light? Uh, Arizona and Arkansas, the A states. And also on that, I want to kind of elaborate on that too, is uh, we haul, this is how we're a hazmat carrier and we're registered as a hazmat carrier with the Federal Motor Carrier System then 25% of our loads have to pull it and be inspected, even if we have FAK on, freight of all kinds. Because I've had drivers ask me, well, I, had, I just had general cargo on, they pulled me in and done an inspection. Well, that's why whenever they pull us in, up in the system, in the database, it shows us as a hazmat transporter, so they're required to inspect us, and it doesn't matter what cargo you have on. Okay. Okay, okay vehicle maintenance. Whenever we talk about vehicle maintenance, I listed quite a few here on vehicle maintenance. And basically, vehicle maintenance encompasses brakes, lights, any kind of defect, failure to make required repairs, or anything to do with the airlines or, or air hoses or whatever. The big one is the chafing of airlines. Whenever they cannot find anything else, they can find chafing of airlines. Because there's always some hoses rubbing, it seems like. So, uh, the big one, the big hitter was the uh, lights burned out. Your marker lights or your brake lights or, or tail lights or whatever uh, being burned out. It only carries a severity weight of two, but in the last 24 months we've actually had 40 of these violations where the lights are burned out. The next one is a uh, tire splat. That carries a, a weight of eight, so that's an out of service violation. So that's 30 CSA points against the company and against the driver when you pull into the scales or if roadside stops you and you have a flat tire. And then, of course, uh, your brakes out of adjustment, the ABS, and this ABS malfunction uh, indicator lamp, due to the way our, our uh, pigtail is wired, it's hot all the time, you have to go through a certain procedure to make sure that that's working, and sometimes the officer doesn't understand that, so you need to talk to maintenance, talk to Rob or Bruce or one of those guys, and they can explain it to you exactly the procedure for for checking that, the way the trucks are wired up. So, anyway, uh, of course, the next one's dealing with brakes, inspections, brake system, brakes, brake tubing hose, and you can see all the different scores, the averages there. So, as far as the severity weight that it carries. Okay. We do have a question about tires. Mm -hmm. uh, do you get points counted against you if you pull over for a tire tire change because you're close to the ground? Not really. Because you're what? Close to the ground, close to the ground? I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure, close, close to the from ground. from Virgil Ackridge. I'll just, maybe he can just email. Yeah, time she give you a message. call. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. okay, controlled substance and alcohol. Luckily we haven't had any, so that's a good thing. So there's nothing to report, it's zero. Okay. Hazardous material compliance. This is the big one. This is what we're doing. All in hazardous materials, hazardous waste. So the very first one, vehicle not placard is required. That's a big one because that's exactly what the DOT officer is looking at when they first pull you in or looking at the placards on the truck, or I should say on the trailer or conveyance, whatever. So just to reiterate on this placarding, sometimes the customer will give you a load and tally sheet do not go off of that load and tally sheet. Figure your own. We've got, we give you tally sheets that you can, blank ones that you can use where you can figure out what type or how many placards you need. And also remember, separate bulk from non-bulk. The reason you have to do that is with a bulk package, you're going to have to display the placard along with the appropriate ID number. Then you go on to placarding all the non-bulk packages. And I often get the question, well, I got a flammable 3 bulk package, say 1263, 
And I've got that on my vehicle. Do I need the Flamble 3 placard for non-bulk if I got over 2,205 pounds? And the answer is yes, you do. So, in fact, I had that question uh, yesterday. So, remember, you placard for your bulk, and then you placard for your non-bulk with the three steps that we give you to placard for non-bulk mixed loads. Next one, shipping paper accessibility. Um, I know sometimes you get a couple hundred manifests or you get a hundred manifest, and it's pretty hard to put them where you have accessibility to them. And the regulation says that you must, they must be within your reach while restrained by the seat device. So if you have a small stack, the pouch on the driver's door is an excellent place for them. However, if you have a big stack, then I would recommend putting them in a box next to the driver's seat, but make sure the box does not have a lid on it. Because we got dinged the other day for shipping papers being in a, in a uh, tote with the lid closed on it. And also, if you have multiple shipping papers with has and non-has, you're going to have to tab the has. So you can distinguish, so the officer can distinguish the difference between the has and the non-has. So shipping paper accessibility is a big one. That's a big one. We had an officer the other day tell the driver, just put them on the dash. Do not put your shipping papers on the dash. Do not. Do not do that. Okay, uh, package not secured in vehicle. Whenever you're picking up at these waste sites, I know sometimes the trailers are preloaded, but very seldom do they have a, a, a lock on them or a seal on them. So open the doors and do a visual inspection. And whenever you open the doors, use the door as a shield. In other words, when you open the door, stay behind it, walk around the trailers, you're opening the door. Let the trailer vent for a few minutes, and then you can do a visual inspection of the load to make sure it's properly secured. If it's not, then you need to get with the shipper or the generator and make sure the load gets properly uh, secured. Uh, Placard's not securely affixed or attached. That, that is what it is. You know, in other words, we lose the placard whenever it's raining. We'll have some stick-ons or we've got some that we put in the sleeves of the trailer. It starts storming or raining and we're running at, <coughs> excuse me, we're running in adverse weather conditions and the placard comes out. So that's what's happening there. Uh, accessibility emergency response information, that's your ERG book, and that's the exact same as your shipping papers as far as must be within reach while restrained by the seat device, or if you're out of the vehicle, driver's pouch, or the driver's seat. So put your ERG book in the pouch on the driver's door, you're always in compliance. Uh, no placards or markings when required. Basically that one is the ID numbers are not on the trailer when we have bulk packages. So the placards are there, but the ID numbers are missing. No improper hazard class or division number. Again, that's on the shipping papers where the subsidiary hazards are left off of the shipping paper sometimes. And remember on your hazardous waste manifest or in any shipping paper, a subsidiary hazard must be immediately after the primary hazard in parentheses. And then a uh, basic description, not in the proper sequence. Sometimes we'll see these shipping papers where they're done it the old way, where they start out putting the proper shipping name first. It's not the way it works. It has to have the ID number first, and then the proper shipping name, and then the hazard class, and then the packing group if applicable. Okay, RQ not on the shipping papers. That's a pretty tough one for you to figure out because the RQs, you don't know the breakdown of the chemicals in those packages. So uh, the RQ is a tough one to figure. And usually I will data queue challenge whenever we get RQ shipping paper, RQ violations on shipping papers because the officer doesn't know the breakdown of the chemicals. They may call it a, a waste flammable liquid and it's got a bunch of different constituents in it. So the RQ may be 100 pounds and the drum weighs 500 pounds, but the RQ is based off of that one single item, the one single uh, constituent. So again, uh, if we get one of these, I'll data queue challenge it. Okay. Driver fitness. On the driver fitness, this is invalid license, medically unfit to operate a commercial motor vehicle. So you see, operating a commercial motor vehicle without a CDL. Did we hire somebody that did not have a CDL? No, we did not. They had a CDL. It's just that something happened and it got suspended and we didn't know about it and by the time we got the report they got stopped by DOT or, or whomever, roadside enforcement, and, and uh, saw that their CDL was suspended. 
Okay, uh, again, the next one is driving a CDL was suspended for safety related or unknown reasons. So that is what it is. Then the failure to submit medical certification, in other words, they got their physical, they just, uh, and they went down to the state agency and they certified it. Just it takes some of these state agencies two or three days to actually certify it and get it in the database. So that's why we're sticklers about making sure it's certified and no, you can't go out till we get confirmation from the state that it is certified. And I've seen it take up to seven days for some of the states to recognize it as being certified. So I know you've went down, you certified it with the state or you called them or however you done it. Sometimes we still tell you, no, you can't go yet. We gotta have confirmation that it's certified. And then uh, driving and operating commercial motor vehicle without proper endorsement or in violation restrictions. And this one right here was the driver pulled into the scale house. The restriction was on their license that they were to wear corrective lenses. The officer says, hand me your paperwork. The driver pulls his glasses off to get his paperwork and he hands the officer the paperwork. And the officer, and along with his credentials, and the officer looks at his credentials and says, hey, this says you're supposed to wear your corrective lenses. You don't have them on. So he writes them up. So we've had this happen twice, and yeah, I, I think the same thing you do about that. Okay. So the SMS group care by basics with other carriers that have a similar number of safety events. So that's how they rate us. They look at other carriers that are, that are having the same type of safety events that we are as far as crashes, inspections, and violations. And then they rank the carriers in that group and in the last 24 months, we've had over 1,600 inspections. That's a lot of inspections. So there's a, there's a 500 cutoff. So anybody above 500, you're all kind of ranked in the same group. So that's the group that we're in. And then they, they assign a percentile, zero to 100. Of course, the higher the number, that's not good. You want to maintain a low number. We do not have any of the basics, the seven basics. None of them are in the alert area. So again, we want to still tackle these. We want to maintain our CSA scores. We want to keep our percentile low. Okay. So get road smart about uh, the SCA. So again, this is just some information about it to learn more about it. And uh, it gives you a website where you can check it out. So every once in a while I get the question is, what is our score? What is Tri-State's score? Okay. I just showed you the seven different basics, but there's also an inspection selection system that the Federal Motor Carrier has, and that has a score assigned to it on the inspection selection system. Tri-State's score is 25. So what that 25 means, whenever the enforcement people or the scales, they pull, they pull Tri-State up or they see us flash on their screen, that, that's the score they see. They see that 25. 25 means you got the green light to go. However, we're a hazmat carrier, so they are required to spec certain loads, so we do have to pull in sometimes. They give us the red light because of that. But anyway, 1 to 49 is a pass. You get a pass to, to bypass the scales. If you have an ISS, Inspection Selection System score, from 50 to 74, it's optional. It's up to the officer to do a DOT inspection or not. And then if you got a score of 75 to 100, it's mandatory to be inspected every time the truck comes across the scales. So again, that's what your that's the single score that we have in our and Tri-States is 25. Just to hit up on a couple of other items, uh, Mike talked last week about Lytix, the cameras that were installed in the trucks. Those are forward-facing cameras. We're not worried about in the cab of the truck. We're only concerned about what's ahead of you. Sometimes we get in an accident and the cameras, if the truck has a camera in it, man, that just helps us out. I've sent the video to, to uh, the state police before and then they had a totally different attitude about the accident. So anyway, that's basically what it's for. They're forward facing. If and when you get the camera installed in your truck, make sure you get a clamshell to put over it because when you go into the military installations, you're going to have to have the clamshell to put over it and some of the radioactive sites as well. Uh, requires you to put the clamshell over it. Locks in California. I know you've heard this several times. Make sure the trailer uh, doors have locks on them. If you do not have locks, make sure it's got the cable seal or the bolt type seal. The, uh, the regulations in the state of California 
allows us to substitute the locks with a cable type seal or the thick bolt type seal. So anyway, uh, that's about all I have for the day. So have safe travels. Uh, we have one question. Uh, where do you get the clamshell? Do we know? We, yes, uh, from the shops. The shops should have them. Okay. The four different shops they've identified that's putting it all in the cameras. Yeah, they'll have the clamshells as well. Okay. And that's all for today. All right. Thank have you. a safe trip.